She thought she was being discreet, but little did she know I was privy to every detail through a colleague of hers who was horrified by the scenario. While she plotted, I quietly strategized. Fortunately, I had plenty of time to cool my temper and prepare for the next showdown. The stage had been prepared and everything will unfurl tonight after supper. So is tonight the night? Deborah inquired. Yes, I am finally going through with it. I'll wait till after dinner, bring him a beer, and then tell him the news. I firmed up. Just remember to stand your ground. He will not take it well, but you must remain firm, Deborah reminded me. I understand. Exactly like we discussed. He does not have a choice. This is what works best for me, and if he genuinely cares, he will understand. I comforted her. Exactly. Prepare yourself for the yelling and opposition. He'll struggle, but he'll eventually give in. Maintain a controlled, assertive demeanor. Allow him to vent, and he will realize. You mean business, Deborah advised. Right, and as far as he knows, it is only temporary. He will reap the benefits once he has adjusted. Then everything will fall into place. Are you certain about this? John can be stubborn. I stated my concerns. Janet, John adores you. Yes, he will be furious. But deep down, he'll do anything to keep you happy, including accepting this. Deborah reassured me. Okay, I will trust your judgment. I relented. Believe me, it took me several unsuccessful marriages to figure this out. But my present hubby is entirely compliant. Give it time, and John will also fall in line. You will have both the security of your marriage and the freedom to explore. Deborah revealed boldly after finishing the day. I returned home to make John's favorite dinner. When he arrived, he greeted me with his usual, I love you, and a cheek kiss despite my efforts to appear composed. Nerves still lingered. This represented a dramatic departure in her marriage. Nonetheless, I maintained the confidence that all would be worthwhile. Deborah had been sharing her experiences with a female-led marriage flame for quite some time, and she had noticed how satisfied her husband appeared in their dynamic. It convinced me that John would be happy with it as well. Dinner discussion flowed easily as we shared anecdotes from our day and discussed current events. It felt like any other evening supper to us. After dinner, I insisted that John rest with a beer while I took care of the cleanup. He hesitated, ready to help. But I assured him that I had everything under control, with leftovers placed in dishes in the dishwasher. The moment has arrived. I'm pouring myself a glass of wine. I mentally braced myself for the upcoming conversation and entered the living room, ready to face the matter front on. John, darling, we need to talk. I began to prepare myself for what was to come. Of course, sweetie, what is on your mind? He replied. His tone was gentle. Okay, John, I understand this may be difficult to hear, but I feel compelled to do it. Please understand that this is merely temporary. I explained, hoping he understood the gravity of the issue. Whatever it is, if it is significant to you, I am on board. Your happiness means the world to me. He replied with startling calm. Thank you for being so understanding. So we've been discussing starting a family and I'm almost ready for it. But first I'd like to address a few issues. I proceeded cautiously. That's great news, sweetie. What are you responsible for? He inquired excitedly. It was now time for action. I took a long breath, bracing for his response. Well, John, I need to look into several things before we settle down permanently. It's only a transitory period. After that... I'll be fully committed to being the best wife and mother possible, I confessed, hoping he would not burst. That seems sensible, my darling. But what exactly do you mean by explore? He inquired, surprised me with his composure. I couldn't believe how well he was handling it. This was not the explosive outburst I had expected. I intended to date other men for a while. Please note, however, that it is entirely physical. You are the one I love. After a few months, I'll return to you, and we can concentrate on growing our family. I explained. I was relieved that he was not erupting in rage. Well, Janet, it appears that you have already made your decision without my approval. I'd like to make it plain that I am not in favor of this. I recognize that you are your own person. I will not stand in your way if you believe this is what you must do, John replied calmly, surprised me with his collected reaction. Denver's observations were proving accurate. Maybe John was more welcoming than I expected. So, Janet, how do you see it working? Well, one of us will be moving out. Or are you expecting me to leave? 
Are you planning on bringing your dates here, or will you go to their homes or hotels? John's tone remained conversational. Well, I figured we were still living here. After all, we are still married. And as I have stated, our intimate life will not alter. I may pay them visits from time to time, but I will also bring them here. On those nights, you would sleep in the spare bedroom. I don't see the need for a hotel. When we have room here, I explained, attempting to remain calm while navigating the logistics. Okay, I'd like to underline that I disagree with this. However, I must urge that I will not be intimate with you while this is going on. It is a question of my personal health. Since I won't know who these individuals are or what their histories are, I am not going to risk exposing myself to any potential STDs they could have. Furthermore, whenever you complete this phase and decide to return to me, I will need to wait until you have been checked and cleared of any hazards. You go enjoy yourselves, and don't worry about me, John stated, clearly establishing his boundaries. I cannot say I am not disappointed. I adore and am committed to you. Intimacy is really important to me, but I understand your anxiety. That is something I will have to live with, I responded, acknowledging his stance but experiencing a stab of sadness. All right, honey. So when are you going to start these flings? John inquired, returning to pragmatism. Deborah and I agreed to meet a few of guys from work at a club tomorrow night. I'm not sure what will happen. Bye. Maybe bring one of them back here for the night. We won't be intimate anyway, so maybe you could move into the spare room for the next few months. I proposed we try to sort out the logistics. Okay, Janet. Don't worry. I'll make sure I'm comfortable into the extra room by the time you return tomorrow night. John replied by returning to his newspaper. Without further ado, I was amazed by John's maturity in handling the situation, despite his concerns and unwillingness to engage in closeness. He remained astonishingly accommodating. Denver's prognosis seemed accurate. In just a few months, John would probably be completely on board with my plan, and I knew the no-sex restriction was only temporary. Within a week or two, he'd be back in our bed. Nobody knows about my hidden key to his obedience. The next day, I contacted Deborah with delight. Hello, Deborah. It's Janet. Hey there, so spill the beans. How did things go with John last night? Deborah inquired enthusiastically. You would not believe it. John astonished me with his maturity. I was expecting pyrotechnics, yet he stayed calm and accepting throughout the chat. I gushed. That is wonderful. I told you to come around. Do you think you can persuade him to watch tonight? Deborah asked optimistically. I doubt it. Actually, I'm not going to suggest it yet. He made it obvious that he would not sleep with me while I was involved with someone else, I explained. Recognizing John's limit, I doubt it will continue long. Give him a week or two to use his hand. Knowing there's a gorgeous woman next to him will make him crawl back. He might be desperate enough for sloppy seconds. Just after your lover, Deborah suggested mischievously. That sounds tempting. Because he refused to touch me, I made him move into the spare room. He is packed up right now. He promised to be entirely out of the mistress's bedroom by the time I returned home tonight. I was amused by the circumstance. I adore how you nicknamed it the mistress's bedroom. I might need to do the same. Deborah chuckled. Absolutely. Well, I'd best get ready. See you at the club, I remarked, about to end the conversation. All right. Bye for now, Deborah responded. We hung up, both excited for the evening's excursions. Later that evening, John had made significant work in packing my items from the bedroom. I questioned the necessity of boxing. Everything when he could have easily carried armfuls of goods down the corridor. He claimed that it would be more effective, allowing him to pick through his stuff and dump superfluous items directly into the boxes. While I understood the argument, I was focused with getting dressed and did not pay close attention. He complimented me on my lovely appearance with my thong garter belt, stockings, and five-inch heels. He made no comment as I slid into the small red cocktail dress I had bought for our fifth anniversary last year. It had only been worn once before, but it made me feel beautiful. Okay, John, I'm going out. I'll probably be back around one in the morning, so there's no need for you to stay up. Besides, I might not be alone. I told him as I grabbed my handbag, prepared to leave. Do not worry, sweetie. I'll have everything moved out by then. He reassured me, but as I closed the last box and left the house, a nagging sense crept up. Though I couldn't pinpoint its source, I ignored it, preferring to concentrate on the excitement of the night ahead. 
I joined Deborah, Kurt, and Luis in the club. Kurt and Luis, both account managers at work, were undoubtedly attractive and, according to Deborah and a few other co-workers, liberally in doubt. So John actually moved all the way into the spare bedroom? Deborah inquired as the first round of drinks arrived. Yeah, he finished boxing everything up right before I left. He assured me that he would be entirely moved out by the time I returned. I confirmed. Is this what he said? Luis responded with a chuckle. Yes, that is his exact quote. I said, I'll have moved out by then. We all share a laugh. I was thinking we could get the little cock to move over and do it on the bed next to him, Kurt said, earning more laughs. Maybe I giggled after working on him for a week or two. But first, why haven't either of you studs invited me to dance yet? We spent the next couple of hours dancing and drinking. I danced with both guys several times, loving their companionship and the sensation of their hands around my waist. During the slower songs, we hugged closely, and their hands frequently made their way to my backside. Deborah and I eventually retreated to the powder room to plot the end of the night. After a few rounds of rock, paper, scissors, I ended up bringing Louis home while Deborah went with Kurt. The house was dark when I led Louis through the front entrance. John must have already gone to bed. It was fine. We didn't need an audience just yet. Leading Louis down the corridor and into my room. I was pleased to see that John's possessions had been moved away. Perhaps I should give him a small incentive tomorrow, such as a hand job. It was definitely worth considering. But for the time being, my focus was elsewhere. We wasted little time removing her garments, though Lewis demanded I keep the garter belt and stockings. My thong had vanished hours earlier, a mischievous souvenir taken by either Kurt or Louis. Not that it mattered. It was not a problem because of John's financial assistance. Tonight promised to be blazing hot after Lewis left to care for his family. I slid into my robe and went to the kitchen to make some coffee. I couldn't help but be disappointed that John hadn't already taken care of it. It was past nine o'clock after all. He'd usually been awake for an hour at this point. I made a mental note to discuss it with him later. It seemed normal to expect him to have coffee and food ready for me after such a late night. So much for the hand job I had planned as a thank you for moving into the spare bedroom while I was away. I ate a bagel for breakfast before going to the shower to freshen myself. The hot shower performed wonders on my tired muscles, and I didn't have any pressing obligations for the day. I chose a comfortable and simple outfit consisting of an old pair of shorts and a t-shirt, since I'd just be spending time with John. I grabbed a functioning bra and a pair of ordinary panties as soon as I finished pulling my hair into a ponytail. My phone began ringing. Hello, Deborah. I greeted when I saw her name on the caller ID. Hello there. So, spill the beans. How was Lois last night? She inquired enthusiastically. He was great. Everything I'd hoped for. Despite a little hitch, he declined my offer. I confessed about John. How did he react in the morning? Deborah inquired, diverting the discussion. I'm not sure. I'm truly upset since he appears to be sleeping in. I was expecting him to have breakfast ready with coffee made by now. I complained. Make careful to voice your unhappiness and state your expectations clearly. Keep asserting yourself. But remember to reward him for his efforts, as this will motivate him to step up, Deborah advised wisely. I'm starting to become annoyed that he's still not awake. Hold just a moment as I give him a wake-up call. I said with determination. I walked down the hall to the spare bedroom and hammered on the door. When I called out John's name, I received no response. Trying again, I received quiet once more. Finally, I turned the doorknob and flung it open. Damn, I said, shocked. What's happening? Deborah's voice boomed over the phone. John is not here. His clothes are missing from the closet, I responded, panic growing. Hold on, I said as I ran through the house. His truck is also vanished, as are all of his tools. The nagging sense in the back of my mind continued to strengthen. No. I gave a gasp. What? What's happening? Denver pressed impatiently. John moved out. Now everything becomes sense. I misread his meaning. He did not state he was relocating his belongings to the spare room. He stated he was leaving my room. Then he mentioned being moved out before I returned. I assumed he meant out of my room, but he meant out of the whole house. I need to call him and see where he went. I exclaimed in realization, no, 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 that is not the way to approach this. Contacting him now demonstrates weakness. You have to keep strong. Let him come to you, Deborah advised sternly. Trust me. 
He's just having a tantrum. In a few days, he will crawl back. This is actually a positive thing. Now you have the upper hand in punishing him and making him beg to return. It will accelerate the procedure. I wouldn't be surprised if you let Luis or Kurt knock you up and force Sean to raise the child. Are you certain about this? I asked. I am still feeling a little uncertain. Absolutely. Just look at what my husband does for me, Deborah said confidently. Well, I must confess that you have been correct thus far, I relented. Of course I did. Kurt would like to meet you in the storage room at work for an hour on Monday, Deborah added casually. Can we actually get away with that? I inquired, feeling little uneasy. Of course, half the girls do it. I handle all scheduling. I'll email you the details. Simply sell as a gathering somewhere else. Do not worry. The boss never goes in there. And everyone who needs something from their nose should contact me first, Deborah reassured me. We talked a little longer before finishing the conversation. Despite my concerns about John leaving, I couldn't ignore my feelings for him and my want to spend my life with him. But Deborah had portrayed such an appealing vision of the feminine, with its freedom to pursue other men while maintaining John as a faithful, subservient spouse. Maybe in a few years I might convince John to quit seeing other guys if I was ready to give them up. He wouldn't need to know that it was on my conditions, and I might maybe use pegging as a condition for allowing him to return. I'd have to think about that one. But first, I needed to recover from yesterday night. Gearing up for what would definitely be a long, hard day at work tomorrow, I laughed at the unintentional innuendo. I made a basic meal, had a glass of wine, and went to bed Friday morning. I hadn't heard from John in a week, which made me increasingly concerned. Deborah, on the other hand, maintained her optimism, assuring me that his quiet was not wholly unexpected. She expected him to contact her shortly. Furthermore, she pointed out, the longer he stayed away, the more leverage I had for his eventual return. Throughout the week, I had met with Kurt Lewis and a few other gorgeous men in the storage room as planned. Today's program even featured a double teaming with Kurt and Lewis in the afternoon. It was mid-morning on Friday, and Kurt Lewis, Deborah, and I were sitting around the coffee maker chatting. Janet Thompson, Deborah Allen, Lewis White, and Kurt Anderson all spotted a nicely dressed woman approaching them. She questioned with a beautiful southern drawl, confirming our identities. We each received an envelope for her, and she quickly took a photo with a small digital camera. You've all been served, she announced before turning and walking into our boss's office. What is this about? I yelled out her receding figure. Honey, I'm only hired to deliver them, not read them, she said over her shoulder as she entered our boss's office without knocking. She appeared less than a minute later. Do you have a wonderful day now? She chirped as she departed the building, filled with foreboding. We all opened our envelopes at the same time, exposing requests for dissolution of marriage. Panic came in as I read the reason listed. Infidelity. Frozen in shock. I looked up to see that Lewis and Kurt's emotions mirrored mine. Damn, they both murmured as their cell phones began to ring. The situation quickly worsened as Lewis and Kurt got calls from their wives, who had been given evidence of their infidelity. Moments later, their belongings were unceremoniously pushed out the front door, leaving them in search of alternative housing. The anticipated delivery of divorce papers loomed over them. What the hell erupted from the interior of our boss's office, forcing him to walk out and face us with rage in his voice? He shouted our names for everyone to hear. Thompson, Alan White, Anderson, get your asses in gear. My stomach sank as we obediently filed past him into his office. The door slammed shut behind us. Bad. I didn't even begin to cover it. Could any of you idiots explain this to me? Our supervisor demanded, holding out the manila package in front of us. Neither of us dared to speak up. Fine. I will enlighten you, morons. It appears that the corporation is being sued for failing to follow the moral code contained in our employee handbook. Any guesses on why? Once again, silence greeted his inquiry. Let me clarify, we're being sued because Mrs. Thompson can't keep her legs together. Mr. Anderson and Mr. White can't seem to control their impulses. And Mrs. Allen has turned our warehouse into a brothel. Now, can anyone guarantee me that these statements are false? Can any of you confirm this? At the very least, these occurrences did not happen on corporate time or property. Anyone know? Unbelievable. What in the heck were you idiots thinking? And the cherry on top. I can't fire you until this problem is resolved. Thanks to that awful court order. 
Now go out of my office until I decide what to do with you. With heads lowered, we shuffled out of his office and back to our own desks. It was difficult to concentrate after that shock. At least I had a job. I decided to analyze the divorce petition to determine the degree of the damage. It was worse than I had imagined. He provided evidence in the form of photographs, films, audio recordings, and notarized letters. An hour later, the manager sent a company-wide email to every employee. Management has become aware of numerous incidents in which workers planned, scheduled, and participated in activities that directly violated the moral code of conduct established in the employee handbook. What's more troubling is that these activities occurred during business hours and on company property. Given the possibility that this problem is more pervasive than previously reported, we are obligated to take urgent and drastic action. Unfortunately, identifying those responsible has proven difficult. As a result, the procedures outlined below will be implemented. 1. All employees must completely review the moral code stated in the employee manual. Over the weekend, our IT department will create an online course to assure knowledge and compliance. Each employee must complete the course by next Friday. Throughout the day, two security officers will conduct random checks on all secluded locations several times. This will continue until permanent security cameras are deployed to monitor the areas. 3. Access to the store area will be restricted starting immediately. The head of security will hold the key and any supplies need must be obtained with a security escort. 4. It will rigorously monitor computer usage to prevent personal use of business assets. Non-work-related activities are prohibited, including booking meetings, using personal email accounts, accessing non-work-related websites, and text messaging. 5. Socializing with coworkers must take place in the break room during regular breaks and lunches. Security officials will patrol the building to enforce the policy as per corporate policy. The identities of people responsible for these actions will not be revealed. We trust that this information will not be required. Thank you for paying attention to these problems. Management Two minutes later, my inbox was filled with hate mail from disgruntled co-workers. After work, I met the other three in a bar across the street. We were able to secure a small table in the corner alongside many other co-workers enjoying Friday happy hour. Their scornful looks at us were far from friendly. At the very least, we have jobs for the time being. It was nearly considerate towards him, don't you think? But why do you think John inserted that condition in the court order? I wondered aloud. Lewis scoffed. Come on, it's clear he wasn't attempting to spare your feelings. He did it to cause greater pain. What do you mean? I inquired. My voice was filled with both interest and trepidation. Alimony. It might not matter because he is citing adultery. However, this is only insurance against that possibility. Lewis said that if you are employed and earning, a judge is unlikely to order alimony. If you lose your job and struggle to locate another, a sympathetic court may offer you financial assistance until you get back on your feet. So you keep your job until the divorce is finalized. Once that is completed and a settlement with our firm is made... We may all find ourselves out of employment, without alimony. This was not intended to aid you. It was all about shielding his own back. I will just quit on Monday. Then I declared, striving to exert control over the situation. Good grief. Are you actually a natural blonde? Kurt noted. What do you mean? I asked, feeling a little defensive. Resuming is like raising a red flag to the judge, Lewis remarked coldly. If you quit your job after receiving divorce papers, it will appear that you are attempting to manipulate the situation to obtain alimony. Trust me, the judge will not accept any other reason. You will be viewed as someone attempting to game the system. Your best hope is to stick onto that job for dear life and save every cash you can. It's going to become worse for Lewis and me. Kurt chimed in. Given our children's involvement, our wives are likely to receive alimony and child support awards. Consider the chaos that ensues when we unexpectedly lose our employment and are unable to find anything comparable in terms of pay. Alimony and child support payments are made depending on our current incomes at the time of enforcement, I muttered, letting the weight of the situation sink in. This whole female-led marriage thing didn't sound so good anymore. I decided I needed to have a serious conversation with John and figure things out. As much as I wanted to support my friends, losing my spouse was not an option. What was I even thinking? 
Forget my buddies. If putting them under the bus could preserve my marriage, then let the tossing commence. I quickly grabbed out my phone and prepared to make the call. We apologize, but the number you phoned does not accept calls from this number. Damn. Give me your phone, Deborah. Why? Because John has blocked my number. I need to talk to him and resolve this shitstorm. She handed me her phone as my three companions stared at me suspiciously. We apologize, but the number you phoned does not accept calls from this number. Damn. He denied your request to try Kurt or Lewis? Not a really good concept. I'm attempting to repair things here. What do you think he will do if he discovers that the first call I make to him is from the phone of one of my lovers? Yes, I understand. He already thinks I'm foolish. At this point, I can't even deny it. Given what transpired at the office today, I can only say that I received a tremendous wake-up call. I was in full panic mode. How can you locate down a partner who is purposefully avoiding you on a Friday evening? Staking out his workplace was pointless because it was closed and he didn't work weekends. With our cell phones and most likely our home and work phones, direct conversation was out of the question. Face to face seemed like the only way I could find him and confront him head on. Forget my pride. Forget about the marriages of the other women right now. All I wanted to do was reconcile with my husband. I scanned through my contacts, hoping that one of his buddies may have a clue. Unfortunately, none of our mutual friends appeared to know anything. Well, that is not fully correct. Those who still spoke to me had no knowledge, but those who now detested me knew everything. They weren't about to help me, though. Instead, they scoffed at my demands for help, refusing to even relay a message. It was humiliating. As I hung up the phone after my futile attempt to contact John, I sank lower into my seat, nursing my fourth drink. Just then, Lewis spoke up with what he likely thought was a stroke of genius. Well, he began, since our lives had already been wasted, why don't we go to Janet's and spend the night as a foursome? I couldn't believe what I heard. Did he truly believe that was a good idea? Perhaps to him. But after receiving the reality check, I couldn't entertain the thought. Despite feeling as if everything was falling apart, I clung to the sliver of hope that John and I could save our relationship. That hope would vanish in an instant if I agreed to Lewis's suggestion. Politely declining, I suggested that Deborah take them home with her. I had a husband to try to reclaim, and I wasn't about to blow that chance. Over the weekend, I tried every possible method to find John, from searching motel parking lots for his truck to driving by his friends' houses at various times. I investigated every possible avenue. I even tried to tell his best friend, hoping he would abandon me for John. But despite my efforts, I came up empty-handed. I stationed myself across the street from his workplace on Monday morning, waiting for him to arrive. However, as the morning progressed, John never showed up. Disheartened, I lingered for another hour, but there was still no sign of him. By then, I was already late for my own job, but I was beyond caring. The impending settlement meant my employment status was precarious anyway. Bracing myself, I entered the office and approached the receptionist, hoping for some information on John's whereabouts. Unfortunately, I learned he was on leave for the next two weeks. Ignoring the boss's glare, I trudged into the office already two hours late. At this point, I had exhausted all conventional means of reaching John. Phones were either blocked or risky to use. His friends were uncombed, furtive, and I couldn't even get a message to him at his workplace. Showing up unannounced at his doorstep wasn't feasible, and I had no interest for postal correspondence. As I settled into my desk, a glimmer of hope emerged. Email. John was diligent about checking his emails. With nothing to lose, I decided to give it a shot, praying that he hadn't blocked my emails. It was worth a try. John... I won't attempt to fabricate excuses as it would only waste our time. I must admit I seem to have caught a sudden case of foolishness. It's not fair to blame, Deborah. I made my own misguided decision, yet the allure of her talk about a female-led marriage seemed irresistible at the time. Deep down, I knew better than to think you entertained such an idea. It took a metaphorical blow to the head for me to snap out of it. I'm awake now, profoundly embarrassed and genuinely sorry for my actions. I understand... If you can't forgive me just yet, John, despite my recent behavior, my love for you remains unwavering. Please don't blame yourself. This was entirely my doing, born out of sheer idiocy and selfishness. John, my love, 
though I know I don't deserve it. I beg for your forgiveness. I'm pleading for another chance, willing to do whatever it takes to earn your trust back. I see now how foolish I was to pursue following him, and I am eager to embrace an MF with you. Yes, John, I am committing myself completely to you, ready to carry out your every demand. I comprehend the significance of the word, anything. Thank you, John. I put everything on the line for you, because it was a condition of my return to you. I have previously had STD testing and the results should be available in a few days. Just let me know where to mail them, and I'll make sure you get them right away. John, you are the finest man I have ever known. I trust that you would never purposefully injure me even if I deserved it. I acknowledge all of this. I'm not asking you to forget or trust me again. All I want is the chance to be yours in whatever manner you like. I want nothing more than to reunite with you, even if that means accepting the end of our marriage. I hope it does not come to that, but I understand that the decision is not mine to make. I accept full responsibility for my acts, and I'm willing to face any repercussions you consider appropriate. Regarding Deborah Kurt Lewis's lawsuit against my company, Deborah tricked me into joining in this scam, and Lewis and Kurt took advantage of the situation. As you are aware, I will be sacked after the litigation is resolved. We're all accountable. Feel free to handle them whatever you see fit. I'm even willing to help if you want. From now on, I voluntarily submit to you. Your dedicated servant, Janet. Epilogue. Fortunately, John had not blocked my email yet. Even more incredible was that he really read it. Of course, he did not entirely believe my words. After all, I had already broken the most important commitment I had ever made forsaking all others. Given my failure to keep that promise, it was logical that he would question my commitment to any future promises. All I could do was show my sincerity to him through regular behaviors over time. It's been two years since I sent that email. Following the settlement of the company litigation, Lewis and Kurt became heavily involved in the turbulence of their divorces. All four of us were quickly fired from our positions. Lewis and Kurt eventually found new employment. Despite much reduced salaries, they were forced to move to a cramped two-bedroom apartment in one of the city's most unattractive neighborhoods, where they struggled to make ends meet. They discovered that their social lives had dwindled to almost nothing. Their ex-wives took advantage of the situation to distance their children from them. I've heard that both women are now in happy relationships. Regarding myself, John consented to my proposal of being his submissive, Yes, John wanted to test my commitment to see whether I could keep my vow if I wanted to reunite with him. I had no choice. It was a difficult six months, but he ultimately relaxed a bit. Now, he only brings other women home every few months. After losing my job, I stopped working completely. John was promoted and now makes enough for us to live comfortably without my salary. I mostly stay at home, caring for our two-year-old twins and managing the household. Most of the time, I am not dressed. Although John recently suggested that I'll need to start wearing clothing at home soon because the kids are growing up and it would be weird otherwise. However, for the time being, I only dress when we leave the house or have company around. I still answer the door naked for deliveries. Deborah's still married, sure. She was also fired, but no one expected her to face serious consequences. She had great influence over her husband. She will just find another work and her life will go on as usual. Life is not always fair. Yes, right. Marcus wasn't the subservient pushover that everyone assumed he was. When he had gathered all of the proof, he became outraged. I've had a terrible six months, but it's nothing compared to hers. When he felt she'd had enough punishment, he served her with divorce papers. He was tormenting Deborah. He was secretly liquidating all of their assets and protecting them. He gave her the house after refinancing and claimed all the equity, then disappeared. She lost her home and all of her money, but she did manage to find another employment. It paid only half of what she had been making previously. In addition, she earned a bad reputation. She still goes on dates, but the men are only interested in one thing, getting in her trousers. She isn't dating right now because she still needs to finish another month of antibiotics. You may wonder why I tolerate this predicament. Or maybe you find it humorous that I'm getting the penalties I deserve. If you're outraged because John didn't abandon me, know that I thank God every day for his mercy, even though I know I am deserving. Otherwise, I must endure, because I simply cannot imagine life without the love of my life by my side. Yes, John punishes and degrades me, but he still loves me. I maintain the right to depart whenever I want, and John has promised me fair treatment in the event of a divorce.
Nonetheless, I declined his offer. He is an excellent father, partner, and spouse, and I want nothing more. I became so obsessed on the idea of a female-led marriage that I lost sight of what was genuinely important. Instead of finding fulfillment in an equal partnership, I have adopted a submissive role toward my husband. It was not the road I had envisioned, but I am satisfied with it. Here is the next story. My name is Lester Anderson, and it's been a year since my world broke into a million irreparable pieces. To say it simply blew up isn't fully correct. I played an important role in its demise. I orchestrated its demise and then walked away amidst the commotion, aided by perhaps 60 accomplices who participated in the deception. My wife, regrettably, was one of those conspirators, and there was a sick joy in seeing them all brought down alongside her. Prior to this seismic transformation in my life, I was blissfully clueless, a happy husband, madly in love with his wife, basking in the bliss of our joint existence. Our five-year marriage felt like a dream, a comfortable household. I cherished my friends and neighbors, successful careers and supportive families, financially secure. We were creating a future together, but it took an unexpected turn. I wish I could provide some rationale, a thread of logic to help untangle the mystery of our relationship. But the reality escapes even me. She was my college sweetheart, kind, witty, and affectionate. She never demonstrated any signs of adultery, flirted with other guys, or dressed provocatively. I never questioned her faithfulness. I work in a research and engineering facility that specializes in cutting-edge electronics for prestigious clients such as the National Security Agency and the military. We affectionately call it Geek Central. The odd thing about us geeks is that, while we thrive on the complexities of our professional lives, we keep things refreshingly simple at home. Whatever you see is what you get. There is no elaborate sight because simply we are not adept at deceit. Some may perceive our demeanor as adolescent, and it may be interpreted as such by traditional norms. We enjoy telling silly jokes, discussing esoteric movies and literature, and delving into complex minutiae. Regardless of our seeming sophistication, we do not have a high level of social finesse. However, one thing we keep dear is our dedication to honesty in the world. Honesty is not simply a virtue. It is the foundation of our reputations and thus our careers. Geeks do not lie. We recognize how important our credibility is, both personally and professionally. My wife, Sandra, works in high finance at Wilson & Wilson, a significant participant in financing large-scale construction projects throughout the Mid-Atlantic states. Despite their considerable influence in the industry, I've noticed that many of Sandra's colleagues lack the academic credentials I'd anticipate. While they have a great understanding of financial topics and excel at spreadsheet programming, I frequently feel out of place when speaking with them. This division was underscored by an incident involving our decision to name our two cats Oscar and Nat, which reminded me of my high school days. One of Sandra's co-workers recommended we use names of more well-known figures demonstrating the contrast in our opinions. In their society, it appears that prestige and conformity reign supreme, leaving me feeling like an alien. Sandra and her colleagues excel in navigating the complex webs of finance, where every detail is thoroughly documented. Personal ambition frequently takes precedent over individual integrity. The unease I first felt among Sandra's co-workers grew during the office Christmas party at the adjacent Marriott Hotel, in the midst of the free-flowing beer and mingling masses, distinguishing between employees and couples got increasingly difficult. Overhearing a woman casually mention her work husband reminded me of Sandra's professional circle's collective worldview, in which connections are created for selfish gain and loyalty is sometimes transitory. While I may not have harbored enmity for them at first, incidents like this quickly undermined any pretense of goodwill. I previously held... It was an unpleasant comment that took me off guard. My first thought was to turn around and identify the speaker, but a sudden desire to remain unnoticed overcame me. Stop. Listen. Do not react. Blend into the backdrop. A voice in my head insisted. We will all get the next week off. I suppose we'll be fine without crossing the street, one of the women remarked, eliciting laughs from both. You could always make up a tiny account emergency, another added, drawing even more laughs. What exactly did they mean by crossing the street? Were they implying that they'd need to return to work during the Christmas party festivities? The ambiguous discourse made me feel uneasy. 
Regardless of my discomfort, I reassured myself, I made the proper decision in marrying Sandra. Whatever they are implying, it cannot be good. With that, I pushed the uneasy influence aside and resumed the festivities. For the next three weeks, the episode faded from my memory. However, on a Friday evening, as I mounted the carpeted stairs from our basement, I heard Sandra's voice above. All right, I will take care of it. What exactly is the point of having a wife? She chuckled. Wife? What is that intended to mean? I pondered aloud. I turned the corner just in time to see Sandra hang up the phone. What was that about, I inquired, trying not to seem accusatory. She was visibly shocked as I approached. That was Martin Harris. It's work-related. I have to go into the office tomorrow, and we will have some late evenings next week. There is an opportunity to put together a financial package for a new apartment development. They intend to use J Street Center. Explain the memories of the odd conversation at the Christmas party. Resurfaced in my thoughts. I remarked, This sounds like a minor account emergency. Sandra chuckled. I wouldn't call it an emergency, but it's an opportunity we can't afford to overlook. I could not help but voice my disappointment. We've both been working long hours this year. I was hoping we could take things easy this month and spend more time together. Please, sweetie, don't be upset. These opportunities do not come around often. You must seize them while you can. Alternatively, they slide away. Sandra reassured me, I pledge to make it up to you. Her mention of wife caught me off guard. What about the wife? Talk. I assumed you were my only wife. How many husbands have you had? I joked, attempting to bring some humor into the talk. Sandra's face flushed with astonishment as she realized I'd overheard her trying to hide it with a smile. She reassured me, Only you, silly. It's something we say in the office. We joke that we see more of our work partners than our real-life partners at home. It's simply some office comedy. Everybody says it. Despite her attempts to reassure, her trembling palms revealed her underlying anxiety. I'll go in for a few hours tomorrow to get things started, and then we'll spend the rest of the weekend together, she promised with a forced smile. The rest of Friday night passed calmly, and Sandra left for work on Saturday morning as if it were any other day. I will be dressed casually. However, our planned weekend together did not begin until after 7 p.m. Saturday night. Please don't misunderstand me. I value hard work and understand the necessity of fulfilling deadlines. However, what bothered me was the air of concealment that permeated our marriage. I couldn't avoid the notion that our relationship was much more secretive than I had previously assumed. As I waited for Sandra to arrive home on that Saturday, my thoughts turned to this newfound awareness. Despite constantly exchanging work-related stories and anecdotes, I instantly realized Sandra had never revealed anything about her own job. It dawned on me that she had created a significant barrier between her job and home lives, a divine I'd never fully realized before. When my wife finally returned home on Saturday night, she went directly to the shower while I started frying some steaks. Despite my efforts to concentrate on cooking, my mind remained fixated on that uncomfortable wife remark, even if it was intended innocently. It irritated me. Two phrases from the Christmas party kept repeating in my head like a broken record. One was a working husband, and the other was crossing the street. I couldn't stop thinking about whether these statements had literal or figurative meaning. Given Sandra's office location, I couldn't help but consider the possibilities. Across the street were two noteworthy buildings, one a large medical office and the other a Marriott hotel. It seemed to me that many of the attendees at the Christmas party appeared to be intimately familiar with the hotel's layout, which sparked a flurry of worrisome thoughts. While I tried to justify their regular visits as business lunches or client accommodations, my foul mood sent my thoughts down worse lines. That week, feeling an intense need for a break from the lamp, I made the deliberate decision to eat my lunch in the privacy of my car. I... As fate would have it, my parking spot was perfectly positioned just a block away from my wife's employment, giving me a clear view of the street that connects her office and the Marriott. What happened before me left a bad taste in my mouth. Around 11.45 on Monday morning, shortly before lunch, I noticed numerous couples walking across the street and disappearing into the Marriott. By 12.30, the couples had quietly returned to their separate offices. Not a single three- or four-person group, but rather pairs. 
While I didn't see my wife among them, my anxiety grew. The next day brought a similar sight, different couples, but the same questionable behavior. I considered continuing my investigation by studying the hotel lobby, but the chance of being recognized, particularly by Sandra, put me off. A desperate move. I did something I never thought I'd do. That very afternoon, I hired a private detective named Tristan Howard. I briefed him on what I had seen and explained my desperate desire for answers, providing him with a photo of Sandra. His counsel was both confusing and disconcerting. Do not linger on it. Return to your normal routine and trust that if there is something to be found, it will be revealed. Eventually, though, I expressed my hope that my suspicions were unfounded. I returned to work, dealing with a flood of emotions. My investment in services paid off. On Thursday morning, he sat me down in his office and told me the hard truth. My greatest concerns were confirmed on Wednesday morning at 11.45 a.m. My wife entered the Marriott lobby with Martin Harris's arm wrapped around her waist. After a brief pause at the registration counter, they were given a key and ascended to the fourth floor, where they remained until around 1 Two four zero, Tristan, with his ability to obtain inconspicuous information, had a private talk with the desk clerk, shedding light on a depressing reality. My wife and her supposed work husband were regulars at the motel. This revelation came at a low cost of $1.300, according to Tristan, who warned me that collecting incontrovertible evidence would cost more. Despite my emotional struggle and self-loathing for harboring such ideas, I vowed to seek concrete evidence, even if it meant diving into the darkest recesses of my mind. To accomplish this, Tristan recommended a plan that included desk clerk participation and targeted room leases. He would determine which room my wife and her colleague would occupy on their next visit. Renting out nearby rooms to install unobtrusive video surveillance— it required additional expenses, including a bribe, but I was determined to spend whatever it took to find out the truth. The last seven days have been excruciatingly unpleasant. I tried to separate myself from Sandra as much as possible, but she couldn't help but notice my strange behavior, dismissing her questions with vague references to work. I doubted she believed my feeble justifications. Despite my best efforts to preserve a sense of normalcy, my sadness was evident. When Sandra indicated a desire for intimacy, I grudgingly agreed, convinced myself that if I hadn't discovered anything substantial yet, there might be nothing to find. However, while we made love, my heart was heavy with a mix of rage and despair. My marriage seemed to be crumbling in front of my eyes, but I lacked clear evidence and a logical explanation for my worries. Tristan's call from the clerk only confirmed my worst worries. He reserved the room for the next Wednesday morning and evening and I found myself sitting in his office on Thursday morning, clutching the evidence that had devastated my world. Watching the heartbreaking 40-minute film of my beautiful wife, the center of my existence, engaging in intimate actions with her alleged work husband, Martin Harris, left me completely shattered. During times of turmoil, a geek's mind can travel down unexpected avenues. I remembered an old story about a guy finding his wife's infidelity and threatening her lover with a revolver, warning... Do not laugh. You are next. But I promised to keep a sense of order amidst the mayhem. They would suffer the consequences of their betrayal, and I would muster the courage to walk away before tackling the matter head on. I knew I needed some time off. Being under the same home with Sandra was smothering and awful, so I scheduled the remainder of the week off, alleging a need to be at Wallops for the weekend. If someone questioned, I quickly packed a suitcase, left a letter, and set out on a journey westward. Fortunately, I had a childhood buddy, Lucas, who was retiring about an hour past Baltimore and generously volunteered to house me for the weekend. I heaved a sigh of relief, knowing I wouldn't run across Sandra at home in my current state. I couldn't imagine finding normalcy. It was all I could do to keep my emotions under control, to collect my thoughts, and develop a strategy. Ironically, leaving that message was the first time I had lied to my wife, and it weighed heavily on my conscience. But in that moment, escape was critical, and I wasn't ready to show my hand just yet. As I drove west, I found myself asking fundamental questions about the woman I knew so well. Had she mastered compartmentalization to the point that she could rationalize having two husbands? One thing was very clear. My wife had confused trust for naivety, 
I was never naive, and misleading a husband who had complete faith in her was no easy task. The era of blind trust was past. My marriage was in shambles, awaiting its ultimate demise. Childhood buddies have an incredible ability to see across decades. They know you inside and out, your history, present, and innermost thoughts. There is no hiding from them. Within minutes of my arrival at Lucas's house, he read the turmoil on my face and delivered the awful news. His reply reflected my own boiling rage. But it was his wife, Tiffany, who persuaded us to control our fury and address the problem rationally. She did not defend Sandra. Rather, she encouraged me to think about my aspirations and avoid behaving rashly. A woman's perspective is frequently required to gain a true grasp of the social dynamics at play. While my rage was centered at my wife and her supposed work husband, Tiffany's emphasis widened to encompass the larger backdrop of the workplace. In her opinion, it was the women who wielded power over sexual dynamics, whether actively partaking or turning a blank eye. She remarked, Men are pigs. It is up to women to civilize them. Sharing a knowing smile with her spouse, he reluctantly agreed, I want to take them all down. I am divorcing my wife. That deceptive, unfaithful lady has betrayed me, and it's evident that this is not her first crime. I want to inflict harm on all of them. I want to make Mr. Martin Harris regret ever being born with a shred of dignity, and I want every adulteress in that office to rue the day they decided to break their vows. Tiffany sought to rationalize my rage. Be certain you are fully prepared for the consequences. There could be things at play that you are unaware of. Perhaps she will be filled with remorse, and never repeat her deeds. You adore this woman so much that you want to marry her. Do you really want to toss everything away now? Think about it reluctantly. I presented the damning proof, and we both watched the film. Martin Harris is a mere pencil pusher. His domain was finance. While I focused on nighttime runs, he indulged in lavish eating excursions. Martin Harris was anything but menacing. For forty painful minutes, we witnessed my wife submitting herself to her alleged work husband. It was a soul-crushing experience. She smiled and even laughed, while I felt like my world was collapsing around me. As the video ended, a heavy quiet fell over the room. I turned to Tiffany for advice. How long should I ponder this? I asked. Desperate for answers, she merely shook her head, flipped me into a loving embrace, and began silently making dinner. Lucas had followed a legal career which struck me as ironic. Nonetheless, he remained a devoted buddy, and for that, I forgive him. His wife, a high school science teacher, had a fairly analytical mind. Over the weekend, we had numerous chats, and with their amazing support, I began developing a strategy. I called Tristan and explained my plans. It came at a cost, but with patience, it was possible. We established a method for dividing my wife's office into two groups— Management and people directly associated with Sandra. About ten people, along with their respective work wives. My intention wasn't just to sear them. I wanted to destroy them. The remaining employees would bear the consequences, albeit without depleting my money. Tristan would surreptitiously put cameras in the offices of management and the targeted co-workers, while the others would be captured on video entering and exiting the lobby. When it came time to file for divorce, I would sue the corporation revealing all of the employee spouse's transgressions. Throughout the weekend, I worried about whether I had missed the warning signs. There must have been signs, I reasoned. She never seemed chilly or uninterested. She was always supportive. I shared information regarding my work. Could she really live a parallel life without regret? Was she possibly a sociopath? Her nervous reaction when I confronted her about the wife remark on that fateful Friday indicated that she was well aware of right and wrong, or at the very least, aware of the potential implications. I couldn't understand how somebody could maintain such deception without having a nervous breakdown somewhere in the midst of their thoughts. A worrisome thought occurred. By leaving town, I unintentionally gave Sandra and her supposed lover the perfect opportunity to use our home for their illicit rendezvous. Anger flooded through me before I realized the futility of lingering on it. In the larger scheme of things, their deeds were insignificant. I had already decided to divorce her, regardless of her current actions. I resolved to leave for bed. Out of sheer realism and determination to reclaim what was properly mine from the rest of the home, she was more steely than ever. 
I braced myself for the upcoming deception as I drove home Sunday night. To save money, we decided not to film the work spouses in their hotel rooms more than once, with the exception of my wife and Mr. Harris. This lowered the amount of room rentals and the time required by Tristan's crew. When it came to Sandra, I wanted to minimize the potential that she might dismiss her acts as a one-time occurrence. In barely two weeks, we accomplished our goals. Those weeks were awful. I enjoyed every moment. Some may wonder if one instance was sufficient for retribution. While my desire for vengeance would have stretched beyond Sandra and Mr. Harris, I aimed to reveal the entire office's culpability. Individuals who were aware of my wife's infidelity but chose to remain silent. Discovering their deception took longer. Most work spouses make weekly vows, with some visiting the hotel across the street more frequently than others. While we did not catch them all, we did capture enough to meet our objectives. Sandra and her accomplice followed to a strict Wednesday routine to keep me away from the discomfort. I feigned to work late several evenings. However, the pain of being home was excruciating. I created bogus emergencies that required me to travel to Wallops on Thursdays. However, in actuality, I spent those nights in a hotel near my business. On Friday nights, I found solace in visiting Lucas and Tiffany once more. On Monday nights, I returned to the motel to escape the misery of home. Sandra began to complain about feeling neglected, and our relationship deteriorated. She had no idea how deep that shell went. Despite her efforts to preserve a sense of normalcy at home, I was emotionally detached, which showed in her manner. Seeking refuge, I moved to the guest room to sleep and made a point of leaving the house early every morning. After all, I had my own deadlines at work. Perhaps Sandra sensed the pressure in her marriage, or perhaps she accepted my flimsy justifications. Or maybe she just didn't care. Regardless, it didn't stop her from having Wednesday lunches with her work husband. If anything, their lunch breaks appeared to lengthen. It became clear that infidelity was common at her employment, with a sizable section of the personnel, including several top executives, engaged in extramarital affairs. The rot began at the top, as the phrase goes. Months later, upon consideration, I saw a glaring omission in the three videos I'd watched. They didn't mention me once. Neither he nor she spoke negatively about me or felt the need to defend my honor. What stung even more was the fact that she was wearing her wedding rings throughout those encounters, a silent monument to her disregard for her marriage. It was as if I were invisible or non-existent in that element of her life. While there was a sense of warmth between the two lovers, it felt hollow, a lack of genuine intimacy, as one would anticipate from a committed relationship. They were more than casual partners, but not true lovers. The instant I saw my wife and her work husband waltz through the lobby, his arm clutching her waist on their way to their rendezvous, I knew the marriage was beyond saving. Watching them engage in their tryst reaffirmed that there would be no place for debate, justifications, or tired cliches. I was determined to end not only our marriage, but also her entire workplace. I had no desire to hear her apologies or see her tears, and the idea of it being purely about sex was repulsive. Three numbers, four encounters would demolish any illusions about her fidelity. My lawyer diligently drafted the legal documentation, and Tristan handled the rest. On Monday morning at precisely 10 a.m., a process server walked into Wilson & Wilson's offices, serving Sandra and Martin Harris at their desks with methodical step. He went to the CEO's office and served the corporation itself. It's almost ironic in retrospect that the CEO, Simon Wilson, was complicit in the identical infidelity I tried to uncover. At 67, he had a trophy wife who was half his age. What compelled him to seek solace in the arms of a 45-year-old secretary is a mystery to me. My phone kept buzzing at 10.20, but I silenced it without hesitation. Meanwhile, five of Tristan's operatives began distributing manila envelopes to the genuine spouses of all firm employees. Some received images, others videos, along with detailed reports that they could use in divorce proceedings. Martin Harris's wife was handed an especially large envelope. For others, a letter served as a wake-up call, informing them about the unsavory actions taking place at Wilson & Wilson and urging them to face their husbands when they return home. Each envelope carried a brief note, in the spirit of transparency. Thank you to Sandra Anderson for bringing this to our attention.
I couldn't help but worry how many allies deceitful wife would have by Tuesday morning. Wilson and Wilson's demise was sudden and dramatic. Following my complaint against the corporation, a flurry of 20 additional legal lawsuits emerged. Divorces spread around the office like wildfire, destroying even couples with little evidence of infidelity. Management's attempts to fire employees affected by the scandal exposed their own culpability in the mess. Innocent people fled, rushing to repair their shattered reputations. The media jumped on the spectacle, and within two weeks, a story detailing the firm's demise prominently used the term work spouses. I couldn't help but wonder about the origin of that phrase. Perhaps it was invented by a naive husband who is unaware of the reality of corporate culture. Following the controversy, business decreased, and the office closed within two months. For nearly a year, the once bustling skyscraper remained strangely vacant. Eventually, I found myself sitting across from Sandra in my lawyer's office. Tears flowed down her cheeks as she struggled to express regret. After weeks of receiving angry texts interspersed by denials, pleadings, and failed attempts at bribery and negotiation, she finally accepted some responsibility for her conduct. She blamed her misdeeds on the attraction and environment of high finance. I tried to understand the link between her infidelity and the financial sector, but it was clearly embedded in the society. However, her apology was short-lived. In an odd turn of events, she tried to shift the responsibility onto me, claiming that my failure to communicate my worries led to the issue. Ridiculous. You shouldn't have to tell your spouse to avoid extramarital affairs, let alone cultivate a work husband in the first place. Sandra's infidelity remained a confusing mystery to me, and she never provided an adequate explanation. All I could tell was that she had experienced a tremendous metamorphosis. The previously bright-eyed and seemingly honest woman with a passion for business had transformed into a deceptive and duplicitous individual, apparently led by the slogan, what he doesn't know won't hurt me. Tristan informed me that their liaisons only took place on Wednesdays during their lunch breaks, and they had not taken advantage of the opportunity to meet during my departure from home that weekend. It seemed as if Sandra practiced some weird type of dual marriage in which adultery was limited but not totally eliminated. Tristan sought to justify her behavior, claiming it was a bizarre type of bonding ritual. Wilson & Wilson created a poisonous company culture in which teamwork was synonymous with close relationships among staff. There appeared to be a warped sense of loyalty at work, with employees attributing their adulterous activities to a single individual. Their closest co-worker, Tristan, frequently suspected that they consider themselves cognitively superior. I struggled to understand the concept of sharing clandestine knowledge or assuming communal risks, whether it was a shared secret or a distorted social contract. Despite my attempts to make sense of the situation, I couldn't shake my emotional attachment to both my marriage to Sandra and the events surrounding our divorce. I had to decide if I wanted to spend my life dealing with these people's intricacies or simply walk away. Ultimately, I chose the latter. My revenge mission did not go as planned. While I won my legal battles, the company's coffers were empty and Martin Harris faced near-total ruin in his divorce procedures. The irony was not lost on me. My activities had caused both the corporation and Harris's financial demise, putting them unable to satisfy the court judgments against them. My wife, who had lost her work, requested alimony after her divorce. But my lawyer successfully claimed that her unemployment was a direct result of her infidelity, and she was refused financial assistance. Even the heartbroken wives who had been hurt by their partner's betrayal carried hatred toward me for exposing the unpleasant truth, putting me squarely in their crosshairs. It was an unanticipated result in a large city where I could survive without their devotion. However, one person's reaction took me off guard. Emma Harris approached me one evening in a bar, radiating an obvious charm that drew my attention. She introduced herself and sat near me. Her intentions are apparent. She announced, I'm divorcing my husband, but I want more than just revenge. I'd like to confess to him that I slept with his mistress's husband. Will you help me with this quest, Mr. Anderson? What do you say, Lester? Will you defile me and help humiliate the man who deceived your wife? After some thought, I agreed. As it turned out, I had no regrets about my decision. 
Sandra's family was initially angry with me, but I decided to address the situation head-on by showing them the incriminating footage. They were filled with emotion after witnessing her betrayal, giving apologies and tears. Ultimately, they exonerated me of responsibility for the divorce, though they tried to urge me to give Sandra another chance. However, forgiveness evaded me. I couldn't remember Sandra ever asking for it, and my heart hardened for more than a year. Reflecting on the events of my divorce, I couldn't help but feel irony. Despite my experience in high-tech electronics, Sandra's infidelity was uncovered using simple means such as a parked automobile, a bribe to the desk clerk, and off-the-shelf tiny cameras. It was a sharp reminder that even the most advanced technology cannot prevent treachery and issues of the heart. Reflecting on how easy I discovered their deception, I couldn't avoid the thought of how easily they may have hidden their affair. After overhearing a few chats from that point forward, I realized their misdeeds were clear. Couples casually crossing the street demonstrated a brazenness that bordered on arrogance. It begs the question, does anyone care about appearances anymore? It was nearly unbelievable that they had evaded detection for this long. It made me wonder if the world I lived in resembled the reality around me. Were such occurrences prevalent in the field where I worked? Those who boasted about their romantic triumphs were typically solitary figures. Their sole friend is their own hand. Once again, I found myself on the sidelines, seeing the cool kid's antics from a distance. I occasionally see Sandra in passing, whether on the street or at stores. We never speak, and I am unaware of her present pursuits. When our gazes meet, I notice a spark of grief in hers, but I can't bear to keep her stare for long. The sight of her still pulls at my heartstrings, a reminder of the life I once had, which is now in ruins. I have rounded a corner and am going on a new path. Like a detonator, it causes an explosion. I set in motion events that shattered not only our relationship, but also my own sense of identity. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.